Energy Density, Part 2, a discussion of depth and pressure. Illustrated as a barometer, a barrel meter, a barometer, measures pressure. It measures pressure, atmospheric pressure, the pressure of the surrounding atmosphere, the surroundings, the pressure of the environment, which in a sense presses up a column of liquid. The height of the barometer, the height of that column, directly depends on the atmospheric pressure. So if we measure the height, we measure we calculate the pressure of the surrounding environment or the atmospheric pressure. How do we relate that height to the pressure? Well, look at, look at these spots, one, two, and three. Spot one is at the surface of the liquid connecting the atmospheric pressure and the pressure of the liquid at the surface. Spot two is at exactly the same level as spot one a depth below the surface, a depth below the liquid column, depth H below. H above spot 2 is spot 3, which is in the vacuum, evacuated, no, no air, no gas, no pressure. So the pressure at 3 is 0. The pressure at 2 is the same as the pressure at 1 because they're the same level. Using the idea that pressure 1 and 2 are the same, moving from 2 to 3, we're increasing y, or height, or altitudes. We're increasing gravitational energy for this volume of this liquid. So going in our analysis, spot 2 to spot 3 is like going from initial to final. In energy density, we go from spot 1, location 1, to location 2, rather than initial to final, as we did with energy. So from 2 to 3, we increase height. Therefore, we're going increasing gravitational energy as we're moving on up from 2 to 3. But it's the gravitational energy per the volume that we cover between locations 2 and 3. The volume of the liquid that's rising to a height h. But if we're increasing any form of energy, we must be decreasing another form of energy by energy conservation. Well, V2 is equal to 0, and V3 is equal to 0. So there's no change in velocity. There's no change in kinetic energy. The liquid is stagnant. It's staying still. There's no motion. So the increase in gravitational energy per volume, or gravitational energy density, is not equated for by a decrease or any change in kinetic energy. Temperature at T2 is equal to temperature at T3. So there's no change in temperature. Therefore, there's no change in thermal energy. So there's not a change in thermal energy or kinetic energy to account for this change in gravitational energy for this volume of liquid from location 2 to 3. Going from 2 to 3, we're, in, we're increasing. Going from 2 to 3, the gravitational energy of the liquid is increasing. But there's no decrease of another form of energy in terms of kinetic or thermal energy. There's no spring energy. There's no springs involved. There's no chemical changes or nuclear energies or no nuclear changes. So what other form of energy can possibly be changing? If we believe in energy conservation, there must be another form of energy that's decreased. But what could this be? Some other energy per volume has to decrease for the sake of energy conservation. But we have no observables indicating there's, a different, there's another energy density decreasing. Well, if we think about energy analogous to money, and energy conservation, like balancing the books. In order to balance our book, we have pressure. Pressure is like the good accountant. They are to balance our energy conservation equation, balancing our books. We don't have an observable, an indicator for pressure. It's just there, in a sense, to create energy conservation. This means we go from spot 2 through the liquid of spot 3. As we increase gravitational energy, we're decreasing pressure. The pressure of the liquid is decreasing as we're increasing our height in the liquid. You know pressure increases this depth, so in a sense this is the opposite, going from 2 to 3. Not really a surprise. But we're going from 2 to 3. Going from 2 to 3 is like initial to final, going from location to 2 to 3. Then a change in pressure is like a change 
in P final minus P initial, or P3 minus P2. Well, P3 is less than P2. In fact, P3 is 0. So negative minus P2 is positive P2, and so our signs balance out an energy equation. This means pressure is an energy per volume or an energy density. Distinguish this from the symbol rho for the mass density, or density for short. Capital P for pressure, Greek letter rho for density. The units of pressure are energy per volume, or joules per meter cubed, and the units of density is mass per volume, or kilograms per meter cubed. There's a similarity, but don't confuse the two. Now, what is the density of liquid? Well, the density of liquid in SI units is 1,000 kilograms per cubic meter. Kilograms per cubic meter is the system international, the SI units, or the meters, kilograms, seconds, the MKS system. You should always make your conversions when you're plugging in your numbers into the SI units, into the MKS units. So whatever density you're given, you should convert it into units, you can convert it into a number that has the units of kilograms per meters cubed. Well, we know one kilogram is a thousand grams, and there's a hundred centimeters in a meter. But I want a cube, a hundred centimeters, for each meter, so this is why I can express the density in grams per cubic centimeter, which means I have 10 to the 6 over 10 to the 6. 100 cubed on the bottom is 10 to the 6th. 1,000 times 1,000 is 10 to the 6th or a million. 10 to the 6th divided by 10 to the 6th is 1, of course. This is 1 gram per cubic centimeter. A cubic centimeter is also known as a cc, often heard in medical shows. A cubic centimeter is also a milliliter. A cube of a centimeter on each side is the same volume as a liquid that fills a milliliter. So the density of liquid water under ordinary conditions is a thousand kilograms per meter cubed in SI units, which is a gram per cubic centimeter or a gram per milliliter. But if you have a gram per milliliter or a gram per cubic centimeter, be sure to convert it back into a thousand kilograms per meter cubed the SI unit. Now using G is approximately 10 meters per second squared, the height delta Y we can solve for with the energy conservation equation. So we're creating, we equated the increase, the gain in gravitational energy to the decrease in the pressure. Rearranging that equation, the height relates to pressure P2 divided by rho divided by G. Using rho of 1,000 and G of 10 in our SI units, and the pressure 2 converted into proper units. Pressure 2 is the same as pressure 1 because at the same level. So pressures are always the same at the same level or the same depth in a liquid. If the pressure was different at the same level in a liquid, the liquid would flow until the pressures become equal. But if the liquid has stopped flowing, or is stagnant is not flowing, then pressure is the same along the same level in a liquid. Well, pressure 1 is 1 atmosphere, so pressure 2 is 1 atmosphere. 1 atmosphere is not an SI unit. One atmosphere is 101,300 joules per meter cubed, approximately. That would be a conversion of an atmosphere into the MKS, the System International, the SI unit. 101,300 joules per meter cubed. I can rewrite joules per meter cubed as newtons per meter squared. A newton per meter squared, or joule per meter cubed, is given the name of Pascal. Rather than memorizing joules per meters cubed, we call that named unit, that ratio, Pascal. So 101,300 Pascals, which is approximately 10 to the 5th Pascals, is one atmosphere. So one atmosphere is approximately 10 to the 5th Pascals 
in SI units. Using these SI units, 10 to the 5th divided by 10 to the 3 divided by 10 gives us a height of 10 meters. 10 meters is a very tall barometer. That's because we're using a barometer of liquid water. This is why you don't make barometers out of liquid water. Because a barometer out of liquid water would rise to a height, the liquid water would rise to a height of 10 meters to measure the outside pressure under ordinary conditions of being 10 to the 5th pascals or 1 atmosphere. It's very impractical, too tall. We use a different density of liquid, a different liquid density, such as something that's much more dense, like mercury. The density of mercury is 13.6 times the density of liquid water, 13,600 kilograms per meter cubed, or 13.6 grams per milliliter. Well, if the density is 13.6, the density of liquid water, then by our equation, increasing the density by a factor of 13.6, switching from water to mercury, would decrease the height of the column by a factor of 13.6. We use g equals 9.8 to be more accurate. The height of our mercury barometer is 76 centimeters, 0 0.76 meters, or 760 millimeters. That's a much more practical, ordinary size barometer, and that's the most common one. Here's another type of barometer. This is an illustration from your textbook. We have a gas that's not atmospheric pressure, some high-pressure gas is pressing up another um, liquid, in this case mercury. The high-pressure gas in the container is pressing up mercury to a height h. And on top of the mercury column, it's open or exposed to the atmosphere. So on top of the mercury column is one atmosphere of pressure. How high, though, does this column rise? Given the pressure of the gas is 3 times 10 to the fifth pascals. Recall 10 to the 5th pascals is about an atmosphere. So a pressure of 3 times 10 to the 5th pascals is like the same thing as saying the gas is at 3 atmospheres of pressure, pressing up a mercury column to a height h. Above that height h of mercury is air at 1 atmosphere of pressure. So the gas is pressing up both the mercury and the air in a sense. So an atmosphere of pressure above. So spot one at the surface of the mercury is at one atmosphere. It's a pressure of one atmosphere everywhere in the gas, everywhere surrounding, everywhere in the tube, open to the atmosphere, and everywhere surrounding the, the uh, equipment is one atmosphere of pressure, including right at the surface of the uh, mercury. Spot two is a depth H below spot one. And spot 3, the other side of the U-shaped column of mercury, must be the same pressure as spot 2, since they're at the same level. Spot 3 is a surface connecting the mercury to the high-pressured gas. So pressure at 3 and pressure at 2 are at the same level, so they must be the same pressure. It's the pressure of the gas. Everywhere within the gas is the same pressure. Gas, like air and atmospheric pressure stays the same pressure. It mixes to be the same pressure over very, very great heights and volumes, unlike a liquid. So everywhere in the gas is the same pressure of P3. Just like everywhere in our surroundings is one atmospheric pressure, unless you go to a mountain height. So making our analysis going from 2 to 1, rising up from 2 to 1 in the mercury, as like going from initial to final, going Upwards, increasing y is increasing gravitational energy of the mercury moving up from 2 to 1. But v2 and v1 do not change. v2 and v1 are stagnant. There's no velocity there, so no change in kinetic energy. There's no change in thermal energy. But we're going increasing our gravitational energy. We're decreasing our pressure. So that means p1 is less than p2. Because we increase gravitational energy. There's no change in kinetic energy. There is no kinetic energy, there's no change in thermal energy or spring energy or nuclear or chemical. So we've increased gravitational energy and nothing else changes. By energy conservation, there must be a decrease in pressure. So P1 is less than P2. Our increase in gravitational energy per volume 
is equated by a decrease in pressure. Just like it's delta P is final minus initial, going from 2 to 1, it's P1 minus P2. Now substituting in what we know, the density of mercury and the pressure of the gas, P2 and rho, and P1 is one in is one atmosphere of pressure in Pascals, that's 10 to the fifth. What must be the height? We can easily solve for the height of this mercury column now. You will do so with one of your lecture questions. Now here is under the water here, a depth y, under some liquid, so it's water, going down a depth y, what's the pressure? Well, anytime you descend in liquid, we can use the equation. The pressure relates to the density times gravity times y, the depth below the surface of the liquid. Well, at the top of the liquid, remember, the top of our ocean or our seawater or our lake, it's one atmosphere of pressure. So we're increasing from one atmosphere of pressure. We don't start at zero, we start at one atmosphere at sea level. As we go down beneath the water, we're increasing from an atmosphere of pressure. So we're changing the pressure as we change depth, as we change delta y. So delta p is p minus p naught. p naught is also is often the symbol for atmospheric pressure. So p is equal to rho g y plus p naught. The atmosphere of pressure is approximately 10 to the fifth. So the pressure, any depth below, down in water or down in any liquid, open to an atmosphere of pressure, is rho g y plus 10 to the fifth pascals. This is a general result. You should calculate how much depth you have to go down, what the value of delta y is, to increase by an atmosphere of pressure, 10 to the fifth pascals. What's your value of delta y to increase by one atmosphere and then two atmospheres and then three atmospheres of pressure? How far down do you have to go to experience a pressure of two atmospheres or three or four? How far down do you have to go to experience ten atmospheres of pressure in the water? Well, using rho for water, it's a thousand and g is ten and delta y is ten. That's ten to the fifth plus ten to the fifth, which is equivalent to saying two atmospheres. Instead, I went down to a depth of 30, or three times that amount, then I would be at four atmospheres of pressure. So roughly every 10 meters is an increase of an atmosphere of pressure. 10 meters below the ocean is two atmospheres of pressure, since we start with one, etc. So our change in pressure is approximately one atmosphere for every 10 meters. It's a nice rule of thumb. Now here's our scuba diver, a depth y down beneath the water, whose pressure we can measure. His friend is at the same level or the same depth, also wearing a scuba gear. But they're in a tank. The fellow on the left has a depth y beneath the sea level. The fellow on the right is in the same tank, but above his head is the top of the tank, not the same depth y. So the question is, whose head un is under more pressure? Is P1 or P2 greater, or are they the same? Well, since P1 and P2 are at the same level, or the same depth from the surface, P1 must equal P2. Even though P2's head is under less water, they're at the same level. If P1 was greater, if pressure is greater at the same level, then the water would flow along that level until pressure is the same at, at the same level. If the water stops moving or is stagnant, then P1 must equal P2. End of part two.